Hello, everyone, and welcome to this edition of our Cassandra webinar series. I am delighted uh, to welcome back Aaron Morton. He is an Apache Cassandra committer and uh, DateStacks MVP for Apache Cassandra. He's also recently set up his own um, consulting firm. And um, if anyone on the uh, line today is planning on attending the Cassandra Summit in London in October, Aaron will be um, participating in the Training Day workshop and also presenting there. A um, little bit of housekeeping before I turn over to Aaron. So um, as always, Q&A will be done at the end of this session. Please use the WebEx Q&A panel type your question in there um, clearly, and at the end we'll go through those questions in as much time as we have left. And um, anything that we don't get to, we are starting to use those questions as topics for future webinars. So if there is a topic you would like us to address in a future webinar, please also let us know in that Q&A panel. So um, Aaron, take us away. Thanks, Christian. Uh, good morning, good afternoon, good evening, everyone. Uh, today, we're going to talk about changing things in Cassandra. It may be that there's some slow queries, and you want to change those so that they go faster. It may be that you're being very successful, and you want to grow your cluster, and you want to change it to be a multi-data center distributed cluster. Something about, because there's something in Cassandra you want to change. I think the best way to be able to do that effectively is to have a feel for the platform an understanding and an understanding of the tools that you have at your disposal. So a little bit about myself before we get into that. Uh, I co-founder and principal consultant at a company called The Last Pickle. We work with clients to deliver and improve Cassandra-based solutions. Uh, we've, I'm an Apache Cassandra committer. We've got two DataStax MVPs, the maintainer of the Hector Java library, over six years' experience with Cassandra, and we're based in New Zealand and Austin, Texas. So as I said, we're going to talk about the platform and the tools that you've got at your disposal, and we'll look at a couple of problems and some maintenance, and maintenance tasks that you commonly will get to. When we talk about the platform in Cassandra, we have a very easy way of doing it often. We just draw a circle and we put some dots on it and we say this is a Cassandra cluster. And when we get to production, we have these annoying little things called clients. The clients need to be able to connect to nodes and those nodes then act as the coordinator for the requests and, ask them, and they ask them to read and write data. When we're actually running in production, it's not such a nice looking diagram. In this example here, say our triangle clients have just converged on one node just out of, pri just out of chance, and they're doing a write, and the node that it's writing to is not a replica. So that node's a coordinator, it forwards the write on to the three replicas because we're working at RF3. If we look at our square clients here, they could be using one of the new, newer clients that has token aware load balancing, Astyanix, uh, or the CQL native driver clients from DataStax. And perhaps they're doing a read, doing a read at quorum with a low probability of read repair. The node that it's asked is a re that they've spoken to is a replica, so that node is only talking to one other node in the cluster. So there's a very dynamic situation in production but it's clear what we need to do now as developers, operators, and architects is make sure that clients can connect to nodes that they ask to do reads and writes. Those nodes can then talk to other nodes in the cluster to achieve the operation at the consistency level that the clients have requested. And then once we actually get to the nodes and we're doing the reads and writes, we want to make sure that that's as efficient as possible. And it's efficient the first day we launch the application and after the first year and after the second year, we, want that, we don't want to lose our performance as our uh, data scale increases. 
Luckily, a while ago, some very clever people wrote down some rules that govern how we achieve this in systems like Cassandra, in distributed systems, the rules that we know of <clears throat> as the CAP theorem, where we deal with consistency, availability, and partition tolerance. In Cassandra, we have a couple of different ways to think about consistency. We have strong consistency, where reads return the last written value. We achieve that when the number of nodes <coughs> involved in a successful read for a piece of data and the number of nodes involved in a successful write for a piece of data is greater than the replication factor. And we also have eventually consistent, eventual consistency. And this is where the opposite is true, where the number of nodes involved in reading and the number of nodes involved in writing is less than the replication factor. And eventual consistency is defined by saying, in the absence of further writes, all reads will eventually return the same value. And Cassandra has several processes internally that we we use. We call them read repair, hinted handoff. We have anti-entropy to achieve eventual consistency. And there's a price to be paid for consistency, though. And if you're in a multi-data center environment, if you're using a quorum or each quorum consistency level, we're introducing uh, cross-data center latency into the request path for increasing our latency a little bit there. But we know that there are trade-offs. Some people, when they first come to Cassandra, are very comfortable with using strong consistency. It's a model that you're pretty well used to for relational databases. And But a lot of people, as they get into their Cassandra projects, will discover that really we could live with a little bit of eventual consistency in some places. And practically, when you reduce the consistency level in Cassandra, you, we still achieve quite good level of consistency in your reads and writes. Now, availability is my favorite part of Cassandra. Uh, as a consultant, we make sure that people's systems are running as the first port of call, and we worry about performance. And to keep a cluster running, to keep an application running, there's a very simple rule. We want to maintain consistency level up nodes for each token range in the cluster. When we look at a three node cluster using a replication factor of three, we can lose up to three nodes and still maintain 100% availability. And I call this the best case failure scenario. In this diagram here, the red nodes are down and you can see that they're evenly spaced around the cluster. They're spaced every RF node has been lost. When we look at range A, you can see it's got replicas one, two, and three. Replica one is down. Replicas two and three are still available. So we can maintain a quorum with RF3. And the same holds for all the other token ranges in the cluster. Now, if there's a best way to do something, there's normally a worst way to do something. And this is our worst case failure scenario. We've lost two nodes and they're adjacent to each other. We look at range A, you can see its replicas, two of its replicas have been lost. And when we look at range B, we can see two of its replicas have been lost as well. Together, those two ranges represent 22% of the data in the cluster. And so that 22% of data is unavailable. But we still have 78% availability. Not as good as 100% availability, but much better than zero. And this is our worst case failure scenario. We've lost two nodes. We can still maintain availability. So we can say to people, our site is down for a small amount of users. Finally, partitions. Now, partitions happen don't happen in Cassandra when you restart a node. Partitions talk about nodes that are able to accept requests but not process them. Now, in the definition, we talk about partitions happening when there are network errors. I go a little bit further and say, well, it could be the network, it could be the network encoding in Cassandra, it could be the configuration, it could be anything. But basically, we've got our Cassandra daemon sitting there accepting a request from the client, 
And in this example here, it wants to send three messages to three other nodes to perhaps process a write, and only one of those gets delivered. So we've got a partition here. Whether or not we can process the request from the client depends on the consistency level. If we were using a quorum, and this was RF3, we wouldn't be able to do this. If we were doing CL1, then we'd be able to process this request. So that's the 30,000 foot view up high on Cassandra as a cluster. We want to maintain availability by making sure our clients can connect to nodes that act as coordinators. Those coordinators are able to talk to as many other replicas as they need to process the request. When we get closer to the middle and we look at the storage engine, we can see that the Cassandra storage engine is optimized for writes. A relational database engine is optimized for reads. Now, not to say that reads are slow in Cassandra. They've certainly improved a lot over the last few years. But the basic way the engine's optimized is for the write path. That said, it's a very traditional write path. Your write arrives at the node, and we append it to our writer head log to give us durability. And then we update some in-memory structures that we call mem tables. Now these guys are always in memory. We never have to page in off disk. So our write path never involves a read. And then we can return back and eventually acknowledge back to the client to say we've finished our work. And later on, we have a process that's analogous to a checkpoint in the relational database engine where we asynchronously flush our mem table to disk. And we create on disk the thing we call an SS table. And these are new files on disk. This works very well with an SSD-based uh, storage platform where updating small parts of a file can be expensive. We flush the disk, we make a new file. Of course, it also works really well on hard drives where we just do one long sequential write. Our SS table on disk, though, is multiple files. It's grown over the years, but we've still got these three core files. We have our data component, which contains your row key, column name value, row key, column name value, and then uh, so forth. And we have an index component, which contains the row key and the offset into the data file, and then the next row key offset into the data file. And we have our bloom filter, the filter.db component. And this is the guy we'll see in a minute, but we keep this in memory to improve our efficiency. So after a while, this storage engine, which is called a log-structured storage engine, <clears throat> has been having a fun time running around creating new files on disk. We end up <coughs> with a situation we see now. We've got one row, the foo row, and it's distributed over three different SS tables on disk, and we've got five on disk totally. So our read path has more work to do. And in general, we can say the read path has to read the columns from each SS table and then merge the results. Now, that sounds very inefficient. Of course, we do that in a very efficient way. But that's generally what we need to do. So we have sort of a three or a four step read path here. The filter component that I mentioned before is called our Bloom filter. This is a space efficient, <coughs> sorry, a space efficient uh, probabilistic data structure that will tell us if a row key definitely does not exist in the SS table that we're looking at, or may exist with a certain probability. We keep that in memory, and we look at that first, and that tells us whether or not we should keep looking. If the Bloom filter says our row may exist in this particular SS table, we look at some samples of the index DB component that we keep in memory, and we find the row key that occurs before now, so by default, we've got a sample of every 128 row keys in memory. Once we've got that prior row key, we now drop down onto disk into the index on the index DB file, seek, do a random seek to the position, and then scan forward, read forward to find the row key that we're interested in. That gives us the offset into the data DB component and we read, and we go over to our data DB component, we seek, and then we read the columns that we want. And maybe we're going to read 
all the columns or specific columns. We have some indexing structures that kick in there depending on the size of the row. But in general, we're just going to go read some columns. We can put this together pictorially. Things here above the line are in memory. Things below the line are on disk. If we look at SS tables 1 and 2, we do a read. We go to the bloom filter. It says keep looking. We look at our index samples. We find the prior key. And we go to disk. We do a random read into the SS table index component, find the row key, then do a random read into the data component and read from there. SS table 3, we go to the bloom filter, and the bloom filter says, stop looking. There's no chance that you'll find the row you're interested in. SS table 4 is a standard read. And when we look at SS table 5, we have a degenerate case here. Our bloom filter says your row key may exist. We find our prior key in the index sample, and we go down to disk. When we get to disk, we can't find that row key in the index component. And this is what we call a false positive. And you'll see these in some of the uh, administration tools in Cassandra. And to make things go faster, we have a couple of levels of caching. <clears throat> we have our key cache, which caches row key positions per SS table. So if we look at SS tables 1 and 2, we go through a bloom filter here, we hit our key cache, we don't bother going to disk for the index DB, we've taken out one piece of random I.O. for those two SS tables. If we look at SS table 4, you can see the bloom filter says keep looking, we go to the key cache and get a miss, that's okay, this is again a cache per SS table, we'll fill that up later on. So we look at our index samples and continue to do our random disk I.O. onto the index DB component. And SS table 5 continues to be our degenerate case. And finally, we have a row cache. This guy stores the entire row in memory. Works really well where you've got well-defined small rows. Not so well if you've got very wide rows for time series data in the tens of megabytes. But it takes all of the all of the um, disk I.O. out of the picture. Currently, we store that off the JVM heap. It can be a handy way if you're dealing with things like user data or something like that. <coughs> so the number of SS tables impacts our read path. So if we were to build some rules about how to have performant reads, we might say, well, one of them is design queries to read from a small number of SS tables. And that has to do with uh, things like if you've got a row and you write to that row every day, uh, that row will become fragmented over multiple SS tables. We want to read perhaps a small number of columns or a small slice of columns, and I think this is just common sense. The more data we pull off disk, the, uh, the more data we have to pull off disk. The more stuff comes off disk, comes through all the memory, has to get all the way over to your client, and we have to you know, create objects on your client and things, so that's a fairly common sense rule. And in general, we say we want to design a data model to support the current application requirements, not to meet modeling guidelines, abstract modeling guidelines. And the catchphrase here is we denormalize and we um, materialize views in our data. That's a very quick introduction to the platform. We've got a cluster of machines. We understand how they need to be able to work together. We understand there are some restrictions in the way that they work together in a distributed system. Had a bit of a look at the data storage engine. We understand how that's different now to a relational engine. It's a log structured storage engine. We've got multiple files on disk. Good to be aware of that. There's a few rules of thumb we can use. So let's look at the tools we've got to administer this guy. Logs. Logs are the lifeblood of Cassandra. The logging in Cassandra is great. It's very informative. Uh, if you get used to reading logs, you can just look at a page. Uh, the Cassandra logs, you can just look at a page, and without having to read it, you can see the pattern. And if the patterns of logs matches what you're normally used to, then you're you're golden. Uh, the logging is implemented through log4j. You, there's a file, config file, log4j-server.properties. That file is watched by the daemon. If you update that, it will get picked up. 
You can also update the logging via JMX interface on the storage service MB. Now debug logging in a production system can be quite verbose. Sometimes you want to get in there and just set the logging on a particular class. So this example here sets the logging on the Cassandra server class in the org Apache Cassandra Thrift package. Uh, it's a good idea to have an understanding of the code base if you're doing this, obviously. I did a talk last week, a webinar last week, uh, of uh, called Cassandra Internals. That's available on the Planet Cassandra site. I also did that talk at uh, the Cassandra conference in San Francisco in June. And again, you can find that on the Planet Cassandra site. So when you're looking at logs, there's a few things other than the date and time that we're interested in. If we look at the first line here, the thing that I've highlighted in the square brackets is the thread name. Cassandra uses a lot of threads. It's really handy to know what thread is being called. The next highlighted part is the class and the line number. And in this example, the metered flusher is a class that runs on optional task thread pool. It runs every second and checks to see how much memory we've used. It's detected that we're using a uh, enough memory, we should start to flush things to disk, so it starts that process. In the next line, you see we're still on the optional tasks one thread. The one is just in the thread number inside the thread pool optional tasks. But now we've moved over to the column family store class. And it's important now that we know that this is running on the optional task. This call in the, in the column family store is used just to flush things to disk. So if you ran node tool flush, we would end up with a call at column family store, but we'd be on a different thread pool. <coughs> and lastly, we see this activity has moved to a different thread. The column family store enqueued the flushing to disk. Flushing to disk happens on the flush rider thread pool. And we see now we're on the mem table class, which represents your, the, the mem table in memory. And we're going to write to disk. There's also garbage collection logs. If you look in the Cassandra emv.sh file, you'll see a section here uh, that says uncomment all this to enable. If you're ever getting interested in garbage collection or you're having issues with it, I encourage you to go and uncomment this. Uh, if you're using anything less than uh, JDK 7, be aware that these logs don't roll over. They just grow and grow and grow. So you probably want to turn it off. Often I'll go and turn this on on one machine as a representative sample of the cluster so we can try to understand what's happening with garbage collection. Uh, if you're interested in knowing more about the JVM GC, I'd encourage you to look at a book called uh, Java Performance by Charlie Hunt. It came out last year. It's a great reference. What comes out of these logs can be a bit verbose, but there's some interesting and simple things we can pull out of it. Tarnu is the garbage collector that works on the small heap on the new heap. This is what it looks like when it kicks in. It says heap before GC, tells you how many par news have run, 20, 224,000 in this case, and how many C, uh, CMS, concurrent mode, um, garbage collections have run. It tells us how much memory we've used, the Eden spaces where objects are allocated, that's full, we've got to run GC. As it's running through, it tells us about the what's called the tenuring uh, distribution. These are non-default settings, so you wouldn't normally see this. We'll talk about them later on. This tells us how old objects are in the JVM. And when it finishes, it prints something like this. You can see now the Eden space is down to zero, so we can start and allocate objects again. There's a bunch of handy information that comes out of Node Tool, Node Tool infos. A pretty simple one, but has some handy things in it. Uh, you can get the load for the node that you run this on. You can get the heap memory, the JVM heap memory. That's a quick way to check that. But normally you'd look at node tool info for the cache information. So here we've got information about the key cache and the row cache. It has 0 0.734 as the recent hit rate. And the quick word about any time you see recent it means since the last time somebody checked. It could be that you've got Op Center or whatever for your uh, monitoring set up and is looking at these metrics. So you might read it might read that every second and you look at it 
you know, very quickly after that. And you might see the recent hit rate be like zero or something very small, uh, something unexpected. And it may just be because there's a little race condition there between two things reading it. You could also look at the overall number of hits and the overall number of requests and calculate the overall hit rate. Load tool ring is my old favorite, kind of being replaced by node tool status we'll look at in a minute. Uh, this is a multi data center cluster in the east and the west. And we can see that the ownership there is off. That's because we haven't followed the instructions and said provide a key space. So when we call it with a key space, now no tool can look at the replication strategy in place and understand things a bit better. And so now it can tell us, well, each of your nodes has 12.5% across all your cluster, across all the data centers. Everything looks nice and balanced. So no tool status is the new guy from version 1.2. This handles nodes that have V nodes because they've got 100 and by, uh, by default 250 odd uh, tokens assigned to them, where previously they only had one. You can see here there's a new column called tokens. Uh, it's a little bit better at, at handling the data center stuff. It breaks them out into multiple data centers. Um, it's a little bit more consistent. Uh, I guess it's a bit easier for a, a script to be able to parse this out and look at the first two characters on the left-hand side and understand what's going on. So no tool status is your go-to guy going forward. <clears throat> CS stats provides a great overview. Um, often just pull this up to get a quick feel for what's going on on the cluster. Highlighted a few things here. Space used total, total amount of bytes on disk. The live line above that is kind of there for historical reasons. That it, there, was often, there used to be a, a bit of a gap between when we had uh, when a file had gone through compaction and when it was deleted, and so the difference was between live and total, but that's pretty much the same nowadays. Uh, number of keys, quick way to know how much load you've got there. Uh, the read and write latency on this, I tend to avoid because it's just the read and write latency from the last time something happened. It's not an average, it's not a moving average or anything like that. Uh, bloom filter space is, is interesting, and our bloom filter false positives count and false ratio. And really one of the important things I look at here is the compacted row maximum size. In this example here, this is a 300 megabyte row in this column family. That's a quick way to understand, is there something going odd? In my, something odd in my data model? Have I got a row that's gotten, that's gotten too big? No tool CF histograms is a really useful tool. It can be a little bit hard to get your head around, uh, but let's have a quick, let's have a look here and see. The histogram that we have is is called an estimating histogram. If you look at the column on the left hand side, this offset is just a number. It doesn't have a context until we read it with one of the other columns, and it grows by 1.2. So it goes 1, 2, 3, but then later on it goes 10, 12, 14 and the jumps keep on growing. We look at the last line there, the, the difference between them is larger. So when we read the offset column, we read it with another column to get the context. The SS tables column is the number of SS tables that a read touched. And normally I'd expect that to be so one to four. When we look at this example, it goes all the way up to uh, I think 17. This was a bad, bad situation. When we look at write, uh, write latency and read latency, the offset is the number of microseconds that it took the read to process, excluding queuing and things like that. This is just the local read and write time. Time it took to put stuff in the commit log and memory, time it took to um, read things off disk. If we look at the row size column, the offset is the number of bytes. And this is the number of bytes per row fragment in SS table. So we keep an, a row size histogram for each SS table, we merge them together. So it's not the total row size, it's just row fragments. And for column count, the offset is the number of columns. Again, per row fragment. Proxy histograms gives us the overall latency. So this is measured on the coordinator 
and it starts measuring once it starts processing the request. It includes all the queue time, the network time, the time it takes for the remote nodes to do their work. And we stop measuring just before we send stuff back to the client. This is a good overall number. Now, I mentioned JMX a few times. I always say understanding JMX will really take your Cassandra uh, operations and development work to another level. Uh, you can access it via JConsole. That works well on the dev side. Production side is not so easy because um, JMX advertises on one port and then reconnects on a, a random port, which can be difficult to deal with. Uh, there are a couple of things around. There's uh, MX4J, which provides a web interface. You drop that jar into the Cassandra lib, and it will pick it up. There's another one out there, a couple like that. Um, personally, I sometimes use a little tool called JMX Term. It's a single jar. I, you can put that on the node, um, start it, connect to the node, interrogate the JMX management beans, and start to make calls and pull out information. Now, if things get really crazy, you might want to take a, uh, a heap dump of what's going on in Cassandra. The JDK comes with a cool tool called JMAP. That will dump out a file. Obviously, if you've got a very large heap, uh, large JVM memory allocation, that file can be quite big. You might then put it into something like your kit or MAT, the memory analyzer tool, and see what's going on. In this example here, uh, we're looking at some Missions with garbage collection. I've highlighted at the top there the line uh, long bracket bracket. These were long arrays, and it's recorded about four gigs of long arrays. Uh, and then when you when I click on that in the lower list, it showed me a backtrace of getting to that. We can see those long arrays were used by Open Bit Set, which are used by Bloom filters, used by SS tables. This was a machine with four gigs of Bloom filters sitting in there. So there's a number of tools out there, logging and understanding the logs and what your logs look like when everything's running well is the, the first first great tool. Uh, getting familiar with no tool helps. You really should have that skill set, understanding JMX. Lots of ways we can poke, we can change values through JMX, we can understand what's going on. So let's have a look at some common or not so common problems that we have to deal with as operators and as developers as well, I guess. Very rare nowadays, but you might get a corrupt SS table. Again, very rare in modern modern Cassandras. That might look like something like this in our compaction, in our logs. So it says the last key written um, was greater than, no, not greater than the previous one, whatever. Uh, so we couldn't, the keys are out of order. This could happen if you change your key validator. Uh, so you said you're using the Thrift API and you said, um, okay, instead of it being a, a integer, it's a string. And so the, the order of keys changes. Occasionally we get bugs in older versions. Again, I haven't seen this really for a couple of major versions. But we know that these files on disks are immutable. We know that uh, the data sits in there. We can read and write new files that have the same, a version of the same truth. And that's what NoTool Scrub does. It reads each SS table and writes it out into a new SS table, just fixing any errors as it goes. Um, a lot of times people see dropped messages. Now, dropped messages might look like this in the logs. It'll print out so-and-so read or write messages or mutation messages, sorry, dropped in the last X, and it'll print out the no tool PP stats style information. You can also see this on no tool TP stats at the bottom has a count of the drop messages. Now, drop messages are a symptom of other problems. They're not a problem in themselves. Uh, it could be that you've got excessive garbage collection going on. And we could be garbage collecting for a, a second in a really bad situation. Could be that the uh, disk I/O is overloaded; we just cannot read fast enough, or there's a degraded disk situation. Uh, could be the nodes just overloaded. Uh, perhaps there's a configuration issue on the client side, and all the clients are reading uh, are connecting to one node. Uh, or you're just trying to put too much 
traffic through the entire cluster, a lot of times people will be running uh, their Cassandra stress tool and they'll run it up until they start and see drop messages and unavailable exceptions and say, why, why do I see these? It's because we've reached the saturation point on throughput for that cluster configuration. Wide reads is trying to read too much data. Large batches, a client trying to write uh, 10,000 rows at once may overload the situation, overload the thread pools. High read latency is probably the biggest kind of the, the biggest issue out there, um, and this is the one that people run into after they've been running their cluster for a, a while. Normally, as uh, it's been out there, as it worked well on day one, now we're six months in. What's happening? In this example here, you know, it's kind of typical of what you might get as an operator. It's just someone says it's not running fast enough. So where do we start looking? Let's see what our caches are doing. We can go to no tool info. See, we've got a reasonably good recent hit rate there. Uh, if we double check that against the total number of hits and the total number of requests, we can see that that number is still pretty good. We could look at CS stats and try to understand what data is in there. In this case, we've got over a billion rows in that number of keys. That's pretty high. Uh, if we look at our Bloom filter false positives, We've got 128,000 false positives, but the false ratio is zero. That's because even though it doesn't say it here, this false ratio is a recent false ratio and monitoring was running, so it zeroed it out. And we look at our read count there, it's 267,000. So lots of uh, false positives, lots of data on the node. Whenever you're talking about latency, you want to go and look at CF histograms. We look at our SS table count per read here, way, way, way off the chart. As I said before, three or four, probably what I'd like to see is that as a reasonable maximum beyond that, there is data model or configuration issues in play. That's way too high. Uh, we look at our column counts. We can see these columns are pretty narrow. They're, they've got, uh, sorry, these rows are pretty narrow. They've got sort of 10 to 30 columns per row. We go down further, we look at our row size. Again, the offset here is bytes. We can say, oh, these are only like a K. So we've got lots of rows, over a billion. They're narrow. They've got you know, 10 to 30 columns. The, the amount of data on each row is maybe around a kilobyte. The key cache is doing pretty well. Uh, but we've got loads of SS tables coming up in our read. So we've just using no tool, we've got a pretty good overview now of what sort of data is in there, and we've got something that's a bit weird. The Bloom filter false positive count, the false positive ratio in CF stats was zero. And it didn't didn't match up to what we saw before. So we jump into JMX term. Just one jar, put it on the node, connect to the local node. Uh, in the talk I did on internals last weekend at the San Francisco summit, I mentioned how you get information about the management beans in the code base. They're all in interfaces that end with M bean, M B E A N, and they all have good documentation. And because I know that, I know that I want to look at the column family management bean. So I put that in bean equals da da da. And I know that that management bean has the overall filter false ratio. So I call that, and it tells me that the Bloom filter false ratio overall, since the server was last started, is 56%, which is very, very high. Half the time we look at an SS table, there is the, the row key we're looking for is not there. We can go back to our CS stats now, and those numbers match with what we've seen. The read count was 270 odd thousand. The Bloom filter false positives was 130 odd thousand. That's about 50%. So something's not right. And the reason was that the Bloom filter FP chance, the column family schema configuration had been set to 0.1 to reduce memory requirements because we've got these 1 billion rows. And that was too aggressive. It's gone up too high. Um, 
the default for size tiered compaction is 0.01 uh, and the default for level compaction is 0.1. So one of the things we did here is we changed the read queries to select by column name. And that limits the number of SS tables per query because of the way that selects by column name work is they go to the most recent SS table and read all the values from there. And then if the, we still need to get more column values, we go to the next re most recent SS table and look there. So we stop looking after a while. And longer term though, the the fix here was to get onto Cassandra 1.2, which takes the Bloom filters out of the JVM heap onto native memory, takes the compression metadata as well out of the heap and onto native memory, reduces the amount of memory that we need for the JVM, cuts down on the amount of garbage collection we have to do. So garbage collection uh, is, is a problem that a lot of people will run into you might see it in the Cassandra logs like this, a warning that the heap is so-and-so full, um, a message that says concurrent mark sweep, the GC on the large heap ran for a certain amount of time. If we detect that GC ran for over 200 milliseconds, we'll log it. Uh, it might be that par new ran for a certain amount of time. If it gets serious, you'll run into this sort of situation where par new has run for over one second. So this is a time that the server was paused. When that happens, the server can't keep up with its garbage collection, uh, with its gossip requirements, and it'll look like it's flapping. It will go down and up, down and up in the uh, point of view from the other nodes. Now garbage collection is tricky to deal with. It's a combination of the workload and the configuration. Workload, could be you've got wide rows, large writes, um, wide reads, you've got unbounded reads sometimes or writes where it's just the number of rows in, in, is just controlled by the user rather than by your application. Uh, sometimes compaction can correlate with uh, garbage collection if you've got very wide rows. You can slow down compaction a lot by making these changes to the configuration these are very aggressive changes, and you would want to monitor and try to walk them back a bit. Uh, the YAML configuration has helped for all these settings. To get some insight on garbage collection, you might want to make these changes to the Cassandra ENV uh, to increase the new heap, increase the survivor ratio, and increase the tenuring threshold. This slows down objects being uh, tenured taken from the new heap into the old heap. And with all of the garbage collection logging enabled that we saw previously, you end up with a tenuring distribution printout like this. And you might see a pattern that says, well, lots of objects were at age one, fewer at age two, three, and four. That means objects are getting through one round of par new and then uh, generally getting garbage collected before they need to be tenured. You look at the next round of par new and you can see this pattern is continuing. So you might want to run with a tenuring threshold of two and, and survive, a larger survivor size. Um, in this case, we had wide rows uh, and one over 1 1.3 billion rows, three gigs of Bloom filters, just lots and lots of data on the nodes. Uh, this was using a very old Bloom filter setting of 0 0.00074. Um, so we increase our bloom filter chance to 0 0.1 on one column family and to 0 0.01 on others, reduce the amount of memory we needed to use. Often when you do that in situations where you're trying to be aggressive, you'll also increase the index interval. Remember from our storage engine, we keep samples in memory. The default is 128. We increase that to 512 and increase the key cache. And finally, we might run with some garbage collection, with some settings like this, an eight gig heap, 1,000 megs for the new heap, survivor ratio of four, and the tenuring threshold of two, just to slow down the amount of objects that get tenured when compaction is running. And finally, a maintenance task. Now, if you're being very lucky and you're successful, you probably get to a point where you say, well, we want to go for a multi-data center setup. 
we want to be able to span multiple AWS regions or AWS availability zones or it's an on-premise or whatever it is, but we now have grown. We started with the simplest thing, which was the best way to start, and we need to get bigger. Four or five steps here. First thing, we're going to update the snitch, which tells us about where the nodes are in our topology. The default simple snitch that you probably started with uh, puts things in Rack 1 <coughs> excuse me, and Data Center 1. And we want to have multiple data centers, so we can't deal with that. There are a lot of <coughs> a lot of other snitches that ship with Cassandra. There's a property file snitch and the rack inferring snitch. I tend not to recommend either of those two. We have other snitches that I class as gossip based snitches. That's because the snitch has two jobs. Job number one tell the code, the current, the data center and the rack for the node that's running. And job number two is tell the code, the data center and the rack for any other remote node. Gossip-based snitches deal with the first job locally and they rely on information in gossip, the, the uh, internode gossip, for the second job. The gossiping property file snitch is a bit of a hybrid. It relies on a local property file if information about remote nodes is not available in Gossip. So that makes it something you can migrate to if you started with the simple snitch. Word of warning about changing the snitch. If a node suddenly changes its data center or changes its rack assignment, there is a chance your data will be lost. Not deleted, but lost. Data on disk is one thing, but Cassandra uses tokens and data center names and replication strategies and rack assignments to understand where the data is in the cluster. So if that changes suddenly, Cassandra won't be able to find it. So to update to the gossiping property file snitch from the simple snitch, we want to go to the Cassandra topology property file, update that with the uh, existing rack and DC settings for all the existing nodes. We want to go to the Cassandra Rack DC properties file. This is the guy that the gossiping property file snitch reads from. And we just set the existing Rack and DC for that particular node. Do a rolling, up, a rolling restart through the cluster to upgrade the snitch in the YAML configuration to gossiping property file snitch. And we're done. Hopefully, that's all worked. Our cluster is exactly the same as when we started. Next thing I do is update the replication strategy. And we want to use a network topology strategy here. It's the only guy that understands multiple data center deployments. The simple strategy is very simple. It doesn't understand data centers. It orders the nodes by their tokens, finds the token range that contains the row, and then just counts around. So we go one, two, three. The network topology strategy does a similar thing, but does it inside each data center, per data center. And it's intelligent about rack assignments. It will try to place one replica, at least one replica in each rack assignment. So we can end up with a situation like this. Our row now is replicated in one, has one replica in each rack of our three. But if you've got network topology strategy and one rack, you end up with exactly the same distribution as the simple replication strategy, which means that we can migrate to that so long as we're careful and we don't suddenly change things. If we've got multiple racks, uh, you have to really think about it. So to update the configuration strategy, we just change the key space to a network topology strategy. We set three for our old data center and zero for our new data center because we're not ready to use that yet. Uh, you'd want to prepare the clients if you're using auto discovery. Uh, you'd want to disable that, or uh, things like Hector have uh, DC aware auto discovery. You want to start using local quorum or each quorum, probably local quorum, for your reads and each quorum for your writes. Next step bring on our new nodes. We want to uh, set auto bootstrap to false for these guys who are coming into the new data center. We don't want them to start streaming in data yet. And we're going to configure those to use the gossiping property file snitch. 
We're going to set the seeds up so they can find nodes in the old data center. Because we're using the gossiping property file snitch, we set the Cassandra Rack DC properties as we did before. Turn them on, our new nodes are now in the ring, but no data and no traffic. Just sitting there. We update the replication factor, again just updating the key space. And now our nodes, our new nodes will start receiving writes from replicas, from coordinators, sorry, in the old data center. And lastly, we want to get the uh, data onto them that they should have. And we use a tool called Node Tool Rebuild. We don't use Bootstrap because and when a node bootstraps, it's not aware of the data centers. So it could try to bootstrap from another node in the new data center which doesn't have any data on it. When we do rebuild, we specify the remote data center. So if we rebuild in DC1, we say from DC, uh, sorry, if we rebuild in DC2, we say rebuild from DC1 and it will pull data from data center one. And if we'd been using each quorum for writes, once our rebuild is complete, we are now ready to perform strongly consistent reads in both data centers. So if you're an operator, a developer, or an architect, and you're using Cassandra, the number one lesson is relax. You've got platform and tools to help you keep Cassandra available and consistent and performant. And you should always maintain availability. Never make a decision that about uh, never make a decision that compromises availability. So I'd like to hand over now to Christian and see if there's any questions in our remaining time. Thank you very much indeed, Aaron. Um, a reminder, please um, use the WebEx Q&A panel and uh, ask any questions in there and uh, we will try to get through as many of them as possible. Actually, uh, there are no questions right now, Aaron, so th this may be a short one. Okay. <laughs> but let's give, uh, let's give everyone a, a couple of minutes. And I'll just take the time to, um, I'll, I'll just take the time to talk about the upcoming community webinars. So next week on Thursday, we have uh, a company called Shift who has recently migrated from MongoDB to Apache Cassandra, and they'll be telling us their story on the webinar next week. Okay, so we have a question. Uh, Chandan is asking, if you can, can you talk about the read path and write path in terms of row cache, um, key cache, disk, and BF? So on the write path, the default serializing row cache is an invalidating cache. The write invalidates the cache. If you're using the older uh, linked a concurrent linked list um, cache provider. It's an updating, it's right through, it updates the cache. Uh, it does not warm up the key cache because the writes aren't in SS tables until they get flushed to disk. Uh, on the read path, we fill the key cache as we go and we fill the row cache obviously as we go. If we get a cache miss and the row cache is enabled, um, Cassandra will read every column from disk for that row. So sometimes it can be an anti-pattern if you've got data that updates frequently and you only need to read one or two columns at a time, uh, using the row cache can be um, less efficient. Okay, great. Uh, another question, I'll answer this one. So will was the presentation recorded and can we get a copy of the video and audio anytime? Yes, uh, we um, record all of these webinars. We make them available through Planet Cassandra, usually within about 24 hours, but we will um, make sure to email all of the registrants and attendees um, when they are available. So do not fret. Um, so Alex is asking, when starting Cassandra 1.2 cluster for the first time, do we need to set auto bootstrap to false for all nodes? No, it's only in the special case of when you 
um, micro, when you're bringing on a new data center. Uh, Auto Bootstrap used to be sitting in the YAML config file all the time. Uh, it was, it's still a configuration setting, but it's not in there. If you're just starting up a new cluster, you don't need to worry about it. Okay, great. And um, if there are any more questions, we'll just hang on one more minute. If not, uh, we'll drop a few minutes early here. So Aaron, thank you very much for um, joining us again. I think uh, I, I was trying to count up earlier how many you've done. I think this is your sixth one, so we really appreciate it. And hold on one more here. Um, so Paige, I, I'm not seeing any questions in, in chat in my window, just to let you know. She's saying, uh, Aaron, she's saying there are more questions. Okay, I can see. There's another one from Alex. Can you briefly explain again how to migrate to the gossiping pro snitch? Yep, so you want to go to the Cassandra dash topology properties file, which is used by both the property file snitch and the gossiping property file snitch. Make sure that all nodes have their data center and rack assignments set in that file. Uh, and then also set the Cassandra uh, dash rack DC properties file, which is the one that's used by the gossiping property file snitch to get the DC and rack for the current node and set them in there. Then go to the Cassandra YAML file, change the snitch and do a rolling restart. And uh, as that rolling restart goes through the cluster, nodes will come on and they'll start using the gossiping property file snitch, which will start advertising its data center and rack assignment in gossip. And until all the nodes have done that, if a particular node can't find something in gossip, it drops back to the topology property file. Okay, brilliant. And by the way, there are loads of questions so we're just in the wrong place and I can't see them. I think Paige is the only one that could see them. So let's go really fast because we've got three minutes left. If you plan on having multiple data centers but only have one data center to start, how should you configure? Um, good question. Use uh, basically the setup that we got to at the end of our multi-DC. You want to be using gossiping property file snitch or the EC2 snitch if you're in EC2, obviously, and the network topology property, um, sorry, the network topology strategy. And then when you want to add a new DC, you just do the last couple of steps there. You um, change your strat, bring the nodes on and change your strategy. There's a good piece of documentation on the Datastacks website about how to do that as well. What is the benefit of splitting a cluster into multiple racks in a data center? Yeah, this is a tricky one. Um, if you're on EC2, people will use the AWS region as the data center and then the availability zone as the rack. In which case now, if you're doing that, you've got um, the resilience against one AZ going down. And you also have to remember to you know, deploy your application in the same way. There's a catch here. There's a there's a catch here that you want the number of racks to be a multiple of the replication factor, or otherwise you'll end up with an uneven distribution. Um, so yeah, that that's probably the main main reason for doing it. Um, okay, we have an XML document with 300 X paths, and that would translate to around 300 columns in a column family. Would you re recommend using Cassandra for that? Tough question, that one I know, but uh. Uh, yeah, I mean, we've done testing where you, know, uh, you can have rows that are into the tens of thousands, hundreds of thousands of columns. Um, obviously, you know your latency for reads goes down a little bit but you can still get really good performance out of wide rows in Cassandra. That's why we do so well with uh, time series data. Excellent. Um, how can a stress tool help measure read performance of a cluster? 
So the Cassandra stress tool that ships in the source distribution, you get that from Apache.com. I don't think it's in the bin distribution. It's probably in the Datastax community distributions or already packaged in there for you. Uh, run that guy first. Um, remember that you might want to set the, look at the command line options and set the replication factor to three. It defaults to one. Run it, have it insert a million items, and then do your read. Take advantage now of what I talked about with those recent metrics. So run no tool CF stats and no tool CF histograms. Then run, and that resets the recent metrics. Then run the Cassandra stress tool. Then run CF stats and CF histograms again. And you'll see, and proxy histograms as well perhaps. And you'll see the latencies just for that last run that you did with the stress tool. So those recent metrics can be a little pain sometimes, but they're really handy in situations where you're controlling the uh, activity on the servers. You can run it, that resets your metrics, run your test again, read, and get the, the metrics just in that interval of time. Okay, great. A um, couple more really quick ones, and then we'll be done. Um, how can we learn more about JBOD configuration? Uh, the Cassandra JBOD configuration refers to uh, Cassandra being told about all of the disks, and you don't mount them up as a RAID uh, array, and then it being clever about dealing with them. Now, there's a blog post about this on the Datastax developer blog. Uh, it's also covered in the documentation. If you have a look for any of Jonathan Ellis's, that's hard to say, uh, Jonathan Ellis, any talk from Jonathan Ellis in uh, for the Cassandra Summit 2013 or 2012, he talks about it. And it's often packaged together into this idea of fat nodes, which was how do we get over a terabyte per node and still manage it well and still handle failure well? So. There's a few different sources there of information for you. And lastly, what's the difference between running node tool ring with and without a key space name? Uh, when you put in the key space name, we can look at the replication strategy. And if we see that it's the network topology strategy, we'll understand that uh, if you've got two nodes and they have very similar token assignments, this is in non-vnode terms. Um, one of the ways we do multi-DC without vnodes is we just offset by 10. So we've got three nodes and they've got tokens 1, 3, and 8. And we then in the other data center, we might just have them as um, 2, 4, and 9. If you look at each data center individually, the nodes look like they're evenly distributed. And that's what happens when you specify a key space. Great. Well, um, that is all we have time for today. Thank you very much, Aaron. We just went a couple of minutes over because uh, we lost a couple of minutes while I couldn't find the, the questions. <laughs> so thank you. Thank you very much indeed. Thanks, everyone. Okay. Thanks. Bye-bye. Bye. -bye. Bye.